Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of The Reading Corner with Moose Changer Pat. That's me, in case you're wondering. Today, we're reading Chapter 22 of Queen of Sorcery by David Eddings. And as always, you should support the original work by buying the original book. Chapter 22. The next morning, before the sun rose, and while filmy mist still hovered beneath the limbs of the great oaks, Silk and Mr. Wolf made preparations to leave for Nyissa. Garion sat on a log, somberly watching the old man bundle up some food. Why so glum? Wolf asked him. I wish we didn't have to separate this way, Garion said. It's only for a couple of weeks. I know, but I still wish... Garion shrugged. Keep an eye on your aunt for me while I'm gone, Wolf said, try tying up his bundle. All right. And keep your amulet on. Nyissa's a dangerous place. I'll remember, Garion promised. You'll be careful, won't you, Grandfather? The old man looked at him gravely, his white beard glistening in the misty light. I'm always careful, Garion, he said. It's getting late, Belgarath, Silk called, leading two horses up to where the two of them were talking. Wolf nodded. We'll see you in two weeks since this tour, he said to Garion. Garion embraced the old man quickly, and then turned away so that he wouldn't have to watch the two of them leave. He crossed the clearing to where Mandarallan stood pensively, looking out into the mist. Potting is a melancholy business, the knight said moodily. He sighed. It's more than that, isn't it, Mandarallan? Garion asked. Thou art a perceptive lad. What's been troubling you? You've been acting strangely for the last two days. I've discovered a strange feeling within myself, Garion, and I like it not. Oh, what is it? Fear, Mandarallan said shortly. Fear? Of what? The Claymen. I knew not why, but their very existence struck a chill into my soul. They frightened us all, Mandarallan, Garion told him. I've never been afraid before, Mandarallan said quietly. Never? Not even as a child. The Claymen made my very flesh creep, and I wanted most desperately to run away. But you didn't, Garion pointed out. You stayed and fought. That time, yes, Mandarallan admitted. But what of next time? Now that fear has found its way into my spirit, who can say when it might return? In some desperate hour, when the outcome of our quest hangs in the balance, might not vile fear lay its cold hand upon my heart and unman me? It is that possibility which doth gnaw upon my soul. I am sorely ashamed of my weakness and my fault. Ashamed? For being human? You're too hard on yourself, Mandarallan. Thou art kind thus to excuse me, lad, but my failing is too grievous for such simple forgiveness. I have striven for perfection, and struck, I think, not far off the mark, but now that perfection, which was the marvel of the world, is flawed. It is a bitter thing to accept. He turned, and Garion was startled to see tears standing in his eyes. Wilt thou assist me in mine armor? he asked. Of course. I feel profoundly the need to be encased in steel. It will perchance strengthen my cowardly heart. You're not a coward, Garrett insisted. Mandarallan sighed sadly. Only time can reveal that. When it was time to leave, Queen Xantha spoke briefly to them. I wish you all well, she said. I'd help you in your search if possible, but a dryad's bound toward trees by ties which cannot be broken. My tree here is very old, and I must care for him. She looked fondly up at the vast oak rising into the morning mist. We're in bondage to each other, but it's a bondage of love. Once again, Garin felt the same faint touch on his mind that he had experienced the day before when he had first seen the huge tree. There was a sense of farewell in that touch, and what seemed to be a warning. Queen Xantha exchanged a startled glance with Aunt Paul and then looked at Garin rather closely. Some of my younger daughters will guide you to the river that marks the southern border of our wood, she continued. From there, your way to the sea is clear. Her voice showed no sign of any change, but her eyes seemed thoughtful. Thank you, Xantha, Aunt Paul said warmly, embracing the Dryad Queen. If you can send word to the Baroons that Sinedra is safe and with me, it might relieve the Emperor's mind somewhat. I will, Polgareth. Xantha promised. They mounted then and followed the half-dozen or so dryads who flitted 
ahead of them like butterflies, guiding them southward into the forest. For some reason, Carrion felt profoundly depressed, and he paid little attention to his surroundings as he rode beside Dernick with the winding forest trail. About mid-morning, it began to grow darker under the trees, and they rode in silence through the now somber wood. The warning Garion had seemed to hear in Queen Xantha's clearing echoed somehow in the creak of limbs and rustling of leaves. The weather must be changing, Dernick said, looking up. I wish I could see the sky. Garion nodded and tried to shake off the sense of impending danger. Mandarolin in his armor and Barak in his mail shirt rode at the head of the party, and Hedar in his horsehide jacket with steel plates riveted to it rode at the rear. The ominous sense of foreboding seemed to have reached them all, and they rode warily with their hands near their weapons and their eyes searching for trouble. Then, quite suddenly, Talnidran legionnaires were all around them, rising from the bushes or stepping out from behind the trees. They made no attempt to attack, but they stood in their brightly polished breastplates with their short spears at the ready. Beric swore and Mandarolin reined in his charger sharply. Stand aside, he ordered the soldiers, lowering his lance. Easy, Beric cautioned. The dryads, after one startled look at the soldiers, melted into the gloomy woods. What thinkest thou, Lord Beric? Mandarolin asked blithely. They cannot be over a hundred. Shall we attack them? One of these days, you and I are going to have to have a very long talk about a few things, Beric said. He glanced back over his shoulder and saw that Hedar was edging closer, then he sighed. Well, I suppose we may as well get on with it. He tightened the straps on his shield and loosed his sword in his sheath. What do you think, Mandarin? Should we give them a chance to run away? A charitable notion, Lord Beric, Mandarin agreed. Then, some distance up the trail, a body of horsemen rode out from under the shadowy trees. Their leader was a large man wearing a blue cloak trimmed with silver. His breastplate and helmet were inlaid with gold, and he rode a prancing chestnut stallion, whose hooves churned the damp leaves lying on the ground. Splendid, he said as he rode up. Absolutely splendid. Aunt Paul fixed the newcomer with a cold eye. Don't the legions have anything better to do than to waylay travelers, she demanded. This is my legion, madam, the man in the blue cloak said arrogantly, and it does what I tell it to. I see that you have Princess Sinedra with you. Where I go and with whom is my concern, your grace, Sinedra said loftily, it's of no concern to the Grand Duke Cador of House of Vordu. Your father is most concerned, princess, Cador said. All Talnidra is searching for you. Who are these people? Garion tried with a dark scowl and a shake of his head to ward her, but it was too late. The two knights who lead our party are Sir Mandarolin, Baron of Vomandor, and Lord Beric, Earl of Trelhain, she announced. The Algar warrior who guards our rear is Hedar, son of Chohag, chief of the clan chiefs of Algaria. The lady... I can speak for myself, dear, Aunt Paul said smoothly. I'm curious to know what brings the Grand Duke of Vordu so far into southern Talnidra. I have interests here, madam, Kador said. Evidently, Aunt Paul replied. All the legions of the Empire are searching for the princess, but it's I who have found her. I'm amazed to find a Verduvian so willing to aid in the search for a Baroon princess, Aunt Paul observed, especially considering the centuries of enmity between your two houses. Shall we cease this idle banter? Kador suggested icily. My motives are my own affair. And unsavory, no doubt, she added. I think you forget yourself, madam, Kador said. I am, after all, who I am, and more to the point, who I will become. And who will you become, your grace? she inquired. I will be Ran Vordu, Emperor of Talnidra, Kador announced. Oh, and just what's the future Emperor of Talnidra doing in the Wood of the Dryads? I'm doing what's necessary to protect my interests, Kador said stiffly. For the moment, it's essential that Princess Sinedra be in my custody. My father may have something to say about that, Duke Kador, Sinedra said, and about this ambition of yours. 
What Ran Baroon says is of no concern to me, your highness, Kador told her. Talnidra needs me, and no Baroon trick is going to deny me the Imperial crown. It's obvious the old man plans to marry you to a Hanif or a Horbite, to raise some spurious claim to the throne. That could complicate matters, but I intend to keep things simple. By marrying me yourself, Sinedra asked scornfully, you'll never live that long. No, Kador said, I wouldn't be interested in a dryad wife. Unlike the Baroons, the House of Vordu believes in keeping its line pure and uncontaminated. So you're going to hold me prisoner? Sinedra asked. That'd be impossible, I'm afraid, Duke Kador told her. The Emperor has ears everywhere. It's really a shame you ran away just when you did, your highness. I'd gone to a great expense to get one of my agents into the Imperial Kitchen and to obtain a quantity of a rare niacin poison. It had even taken the trouble to compose a letter of sympathy to your father. How considerate of you, Sinedra said, her face turning pale. Unfortunately, I'll have to be more direct now, Kador went on. A sharp knife and a few feet of dirt should end your unfortunate involvement in Talnidran politics. I'm very sorry, princess. There's nothing personal in it, you understand. But I have to protect my interests. My plan, Duke Kador, hath one small flaw, Mandarolin said, carefully leaning his lance against the tree. I fail to see it, Baron, Kador said smugly. Thine error lay in rashly coming within reach of my sword, Mandarolin told him. Thy head is forfeit now, and a man with no head has little need of a crown. Garion knew that part of Mandarolin's brashness arose from his desperate need to prove to himself that he was no longer afraid. Kador looked at the knight apprehensively. Who didn't do that? He said without much certainty. You're too badly outnumbered. Thou art imprudent to think so, Mandarolin said. I am the hardiest knight on life and fully armed. Thy soldiers will be as blades of grass before me. Thou art doomed, Kador. And with that, he drew his greatsword. It was bound to happen, Baron said wryly to Hedder, and drew his own sword. I don't think we'll do that, a new voice announced harshly. A familiar black-robed man rode out from beneath a nearby tree and a sable, on a sable-colored horse. He muttered a few quick words and gestured sharply with his right hand. Garion felt a dark rush and a strange roaring in his mind. Merritt and sword spun from his grasp. My thanks, Asherak, Kador said in a relieved tone. I hadn't anticipated that. Mandarolin pulled off his mailed gauntlet and nursed his hand as if he had been struck with a heavy blow. Hedder's eyes narrowed and then went strangely blank. The Murgo's black mount glanced curiously at him once and then looked away almost contemptuously. Well, Shadar, Asherak gloated with an ugly smoke on his scarred face. Would you like to try that again? Hedder's face had a sick look of revulsion on it. It's not a horse, he said. It looks like a horse, but it's something else. Yes, Asherak agreed. Quite different, really. You can sink yourself into its mind if you want, but I don't think you'll like what you find there. He swung down from his saddle and walked toward them, his eyes burning. He stopped in front of Aunt Paul and made an ironic bow. And so we meet again, Polgara. You've been busy, Chandar, she replied. Kador, in the act of dismounting, seemed startled. You know this woman, Asherak? His name is Chandar, Duke Kador, Aunt Paul said, and he's a Grolem priest. You thought he was only buying your honor, but you'll find that he's bought much more than that. She straightened in her saddle, and the white lock at her brow suddenly incandescently bright. You've been an interesting opponent, Chandar. I'll almost miss you. Don't do it, Polgara, the Grom said quickly. I've got my hand around the boy's heart. The instant you start to gather your will, he'll die. I know who he is, and I know how much you value him. Her eyes narrowed. An easy thing to say, Chandar. Would you like to test it? He mocked. Get down off your horses, Kadar ordered sharply, and the legionnaires all took a threatening step forward. Do as he says, Aunt Paul ordered quietly. It's 
been a long chase, Polkara, Chandar said. Where's Belgarath? Not far, she told him. Perhaps if you start running now, you can get away before he comes back. No, Polkara, he laughed. I know, would know if he were that close. He turned and looked intently at Carrion. You've grown, boy. We haven't had a chance to talk for quite some time, have we? Carrion stared back at the scarred face of his enemy, alert, but strangely not afraid. The contest between them, for which he had been waiting all his life, was about to begin, and something deep within his mind told him that he was ready. Chamdar looked into his eyes, probing. He doesn't know, does he? He asked Aunt Paul, and then he laughed. How like a woman you are, Polgara. You've kept the secret from him simply for the sake of the secret itself. I should have taken him away from you years ago. Leave him alone, Chamdar, she ordered. He ignored that. What's his real name, Polgara? Have you told him yet? That doesn't concern you, she said flatly. But it does, Polgara. I've watched over him almost as carefully as you have. He laughed again. You've been his mother, but I've been his father. Between us, we've raised a fine son. But I still want to know his real name. She straightened. I think this has gone far enough, Chantar, she said coldly. What are your terms? No terms, Polgara, the Grawlin answered. You and the boy and I are going to the place where T Lord Torak awaits the moment of his awakening. My hand will be about the boy's heart the entire time, so you'll be suitably docile. Zadar and Tuchik are going to destroy each other fighting over the orb unless Belgarath finds them first and destroys them himself. But the orb doesn't really interest me. It's been you and the boy I've been after from the very beginning. You weren't really trying to stop us then, she asked. Shamdar laughed. Stop you? I've been trying to help you. Tuchik and Zadar both have underlings here in the West. I've delayed and deceived them at every turn just so you could get through. I knew that sooner or later Belgarath would find it necessary to pursue the orb alone, and when that happened, I could take you and the boy. For what purpose? You still don't see, he asked. The first two things Lord Torax sees when he awakens will be his bride and his mortal enemy kneeling in chains before him. I'll be exalted above all for so royal a gift. Let the others go then, she said. The others don't concern me, Chandar said. I'll leave them with noble Kador. I don't imagine he'll find it convenient to keep them alive. But that's up to him. I've got what I want. You swine! Aunt Paul raged helplessly. You filthy swine! With a bland smile, Chandar slapped her sharply across the face. You really must learn to control your tongue, Polgara, he said. Garion's brain seemed to explode. Dimly, he saw Dernick and the others being restrained by legionnaires, but no soldier seemed to consider him a danger. He started toward his enemy without thinking, reaching for his dagger. Not that way! It was the dry voice in his mind that had always been there, but the voice was no longer passive. Disinterested. I'll kill him! Garion said silently in the vaults of his brain. Not that way, the voice warned again. They won't let you. Now. Not with your knife. How then? Remember what Belgarath said. The will and the word. I don't know how. I can't do that. You are who you are. I'll show you. Look. Unbidden and so clearly that it was almost as if he were watching it happen. The image of the god Torak writhing in the fire of Aldor's orb rose before his eyes. He saw Torak's face melting and his fingers aflame. Then the face shifted and altered until it was the face of the Dark Watcher, whose mind had been linked with him for so long as he could remember. He felt a terrible force building in him as the image of Chamdar wrapped in seething flame stood before him. Now, the voice commanded him, do it! It required a blow. His rage wouldn't be satisfied with nothing less. He leaped at the smirking Grollum so quickly that none of the legionnaires could stop him. He swung his right arm 
and at the instant his palm struck Chamdar's scarred left cheek. He felt all the force that had built in him surge out from the silvery mark on his palm. Burn! he commanded, willing it to happen. Taken off guard, Chamdar jerked back. A momentary anger began to appear on his face, and then his eyes widened with an awful realization. For an instant, he stared at Gary in absolute horror. Then his face contorted with agony. No! he cried out hoarsely, and then his cheek began to smoke and seethe where the mark on Garion's hand had touched it. Wisps of smoke drifted from his black robe, as if it had suddenly been laid on a red-hot stove. Then he shrieked and clutched at his face. His fingers burst into flame. He shrieked again and fell writhing to the damp earth. Stand still! It was Aunt Paul's voice this time, sounding sharply inside Garion's head. Chamdar's entire face was engulfed in flames now, and his shrieks echoed in the dim wood. The legionnaires were coiled from the burning man, and Garion suddenly felt sick. He started to turn away. Don't weaken, Aunt Paul's voice told him. Keep your will on him. Garion stood over the blazing groan. The wet leaves on the ground smoked and smoldered where Chamdar thrashed and struggled with the fire that was consuming him. Flames were spurting from his chest, and his shrieks grew weaker. With an enormous effort, he struggled to his feet and held out his flaming hands imploringly to Garion. His face was gone, and greasy black smoke rolled off his body, drifting low to the ground. Master, he croaked, have mercy. Garion's heart wrenched with pity. All the years of that secret closeness between them pulled at him. No, Aunt Paul's stern voice commanded. He'll kill you if you release him. I can't do it, Garen said. I'm going to stop it. As once before, he began to gather his will, feeling it build in him like some vast tide of pity and compassion. He half reached toward Chamdar, focusing his thought on healing. Garion, Aunt Paul's voice rang. It was Chamdar who killed your parents. The thought forming in his mind froze. Chamdar killed Garen and Eldera. He burned them alive, just as he's burning now. Avenge them, Garion. Keep the fire on him. All the rage and fury he had carried within him, since Wolf had told him of the deaths of his parents, flamed in his brain. The fire, which a moment before he had almost extinguished, was suddenly not hot enough. The hand he had begun to reach out in compassion stiffened. In terrible anger, he raised it, palm out. A strange sensation tingled in the, that palm, and then his own hand burst into flames. There was no pain, not even a feeling of heat, as a bright blue fire burst from the mark on his hand and reed up through his fingers. The blue fire became brighter, so bright that he could not even look at it. Even in the extremity of his mortal agony, Chamdar the Grolem recoiled from that blazing hand. With a hoarse, despairing cry, he tried to cover his blackened face, staggered back a few steps, and then, like a burning house, he collapsed in upon himself and sank back to the earth. It is done, Aunt Paul's voice came again. They are avenged! And then her voice rang in the vaults of his mind with a soaring exultation. Belgarian, she said, my Belgarian! Ashen-faced, Kadar trembling in every limb backed in horror from the still-burning heap that had been Shamdar the Grollum. Sorcery! He gasped. Indeed, Aunt Paul said coolly. I don't think you're ready for this kind of game yet, Kador. The frightened legionnaires were also backing away, their eyes bulging at what they had just seen. I think the Emperor is going to take this whole affair rather seriously, Aunt Paul told them. When he hears that you were going to kill his daughter, he'll probably take it personally. It wasn't us, one of the soldiers said quickly. It was Kador! We were just following orders! He might accept that as an excuse, she said doubtfully. If it were me, though, I'd take him some kind of gift to prove my loyalty, something appropriate to the circumstances. She looked significantly at Kador. Several of the legionnaires took her meaning, drew their swords, and moved into position around the Grand Duke. What are you doing? Kador demanded of them. I think you've lost more than a throne today, Kador, Aunt Paul said. You can't do this, Kador told the legionnaires. One of the soldiers put the point of his sword against the Grand Duke's throat. 
We're loyal to the Emperor, my lord, he said grimly. We're placing you under arrest for high treason, and if you give us any trouble, we'll settle for just delivering your head to Tal Haneth, if you take my meaning. One of the Legion officers knelt respectfully before Sinedra. Your Imperial Highness, he said to her, how may we serve you? The princess, still pale and trembling, drew herself up. Deliver this traitor to my father, she said in a ringing voice, and tell him what happened here. Inform him that you have arrested the Grand Duke Cador at my command. At once, your highness, the officer said, springing to his feet. Chain the prisoner, he ordered sharply, then turned back to Sinedra. May we provide you an escort to your destination, your highness. That won't be necessary, captain, she told him. Just remove this traitor from my sight. As your highness wishes, the captain said with a deep bow. He gestured sharply, and the soldiers led Kador away. Garion was staring at the mark on his palm. There was no sign of the fire that had burned there. Dernick, released now from the grip of the soldiers, looked at Garion, his eyes wide. I thought I knew you, he whispered. Who are you, Garion, and how did you do this? Dear Dernick, Aunt Paul said fondly, touching his arm, still willing to believe only what you can see. Garion's the same boy he's always been. You mean it was you? Dernick looked at Shandar's body and pulled his eyes quickly away. Of course, she said. You know Garion, he's the most ordinary boy in the world. But Garion knew differently. The will had been his, and the word had come from him. Keep still, her voice warned inside his head. No one must know. Why did you call me Belgarian? he demanded silently. Because it's your name, her voice replied. Now try to act natural, and don't bother me with questions. We'll talk about it later. And then her voice was gone. The others stood around awkwardly until the legionnaires left with Kador. Then, when the soldiers were out of sight and the need for imperial self-possession was gone, Sinedra began to cry. Aunt Paul took the tiny girl in her arms and began to comfort her. I guess we'd better bury this, Beric said, nudging what was left of Chamdar with his foot. The Dryads might be offended if we went off and left it still smoking. I'll fetch my spade, Dernick said. Garion turned away and brushed past Mandarolin and Hedar. His hands were trembling violently, and he was so exhausted that his legs barely held him. She had called him Belgarian, and the name had rung in his mind as if he had always known that it was his, as if for all his brief years he had been incomplete until, in that instant, the name itself had completed him. But Belgarian was a being who, with will and word and the touch of his hand, could turn flesh into living fire. You did it, he accused the dry awareness in one corner of his mind. No, the voice replied, I only showed you how. The will and the word and the touch were all yours. Garion knew that it was true. With horror, he remembered his enemy's final supplication and the flaming incandescent hand which with which he had spurned the agonized appeal for mercy. The revenge he wanted so desperately for the past several months was dreadfully complete, but the taste of it was bitter, bitter. Then his knees buckled, and he sank to the earth and wept like a broken-hearted child.